Welcome to another Sunday Conversation presented by FingerLakesOne.com. I'm Josh Duraso. This week, we catch up with Seneca Falls Central School District Superintendent Bob McKevney, who later this month will end his 11-year run in that role. His successor has been chosen, Jeremy Klingerman. Uh, he also joined us in studio this week for a wide-ranging conversation. It's a big moment for the school district itself, the community, and a big moment for both McKevney and Klingerman as well. Uh, we pick it up with Bob reflecting on his career and some of the things that he will remember most about his time in Seneca Falls. So I, in my years as superintendent, I've always told the Board of Education that um, I felt it was right and fair to the district and to this community to give them a year's notice that I would uh, be intending to retire. So I did some reflecting last summer and at the end of the summer informed the board that this would be my last year. Um, it, it's kind of a hard question because you don't really think you're ever going to be done but knew that it was the right time. Um, from my perspective, personally, given that I'm in good health, given that my family has grown and relocated in various parts of the country, um, given that we have two grandchildren, um, and knowing that I want time to be able to visit with them, um, and also be able to travel with my wife and do things that I really have kind of given on in the past so many years as a principal and a superintendent. So reflecting on those things and also knowing that I feel the district is in a good position, just kind of put those things together and said, as much as you think it's never going to end, that the time is right and that this district and this community needed to be uh, afforded a smooth and effective transition um, in the superintendent position. How many years altogether? So I served as a principal for 16 years, four years at Frank Knight, 12 years at the middle school, and 11 years as superintendent of schools. So then I guess the question becomes, as you start, I would imagine you have you had begun thinking about this over the last few years. Um, how do you fight off what I would assume would be the urge to say, well, maybe just, maybe just one or two more, maybe just one or two more, because that can, I would assume, snowball. Yeah, you know, it, it's one of those things. It, people will always say to me, you know, uh, when I left the middle school, you know, d d why not stay at the middle? I, I tend not to be a person that will look back, try to just look forward. So as much as you kind of fight that urge that maybe one more year, you kind of balance that off with, but then the timing may be just perfect. And so I kind of came to peace with that decision that I think the timing's perfect and I think the district and the community is in a really good place um, knowing that the district is a focal part of this community and um, that that the students, um, the staff, Board of Education, parents um, were in a good place to be able to begin that transition. And you mentioned fairness and when we talk to people uh, coming into this interview obviously uh, that was one of the, the descriptors that kept coming up, you know, sort of uh, legacy phrase, I guess you, you could, could argue. Um, you have been viewed as a really fair superintendent. Um, walk me through a little bit about how you sort of came to build that around you. I think it probably just happened, but I think it starts with the filter of knowing that as an administrator and as a superintendent, as a district level administrator, you, you you have to do what's best for kids. And in a district level position, very often you have to say no. And so how do, how do you do that tactfully, professionally, and correctly, knowing that you probably say no more than you say yes? And so the fact of the matter is, if if I've been known as being fair and consistent, then I will take that as a compliment because the thing is, there's many people that have asked for things and probably we haven't been able to deliver. But more importantly, I won't say a quick no. 
I'll certainly reflect and think about things that we can do because I'm a big believer too that sometimes you have to listen through the noise because everybody's saying something. And so if it's better for kids and better for the district and better for this community, then we'll find a way to make it happen. And, and I just want to quickly bring Jeremy into the conversation now. Sure. Um, for those who might not know you, uh, walk us through a little bit about your history, even here in Seneca County, and then, of course, uh, professionally. Sure. So uh, born and raised here in Seneca County. Um, my first teaching job was in Lyons uh, High School level and then had an opportunity to, to go back to uh, Waterloo where I grew up and teach and coach and uh, pursuing administrative um, certification, again, opportunity to do an internship uh, as an assistant principal, and then because of timing, uh, was given the opportunity to become the high school principal. Um, so, you know, with that, um, started to be encouraged to uh, consider the next step, went into the superintendent's development program, um, and then ended up with the opportunity to become the superintendent at Marcus Whitman, uh, where I've been the last six years. Uh, walk us through a little bit about in terms of what that experience was like moving from from principal to uh, superintendent and then six years at Marcus Women. What were some of the things that you picked up along the way that really um, developed you into what you are now? Sure. So one of the things I would say, uh, it always takes a team. There's no question about it. But one of the things that I've come to learn is leadership does matter. Um, and it would go back to some of the things that Bob talked about in you know, talk about that fair and, and that balanced approach. Um, you know, it's about those relationships. Uh, it's about listening to people. Um, and so I go back to that team perspective. So you, to be a leader, you really need to uh, come from that team approach. And ultimately, there's times where you do have to make the decision yourself. Um, and that, unfortunately, sometimes is that no piece. And that's for different reasons. But going through that process to get there. Um, you know, I, one of the first things I tell you is, is uh, really looking at, um, you know, policy, uh, contracts, regulations, things like that, that really start to come into play every time you look at a decision um, as a superintendent, uh, more so than as you go down uh, the chain. So that's one of the things that very quickly I said, okay, I, I got to make a decision. Here's different things I need to look at before I do that. Um, the biggest thing, I think, is really just listening, uh, trusting, and empowering other people to do their job. Um, and so there's people just like myself that you come into something you're new. Um, it's coaching them. It's giving them the opportunity. It's paying attention where are their strengths, where are their weaknesses, and helping them grow. And that's one of the, been the uh, I think, one of the greatest rewards for myself, um, you know, as I move, continue to move up and um, providing that uh, growth, or, or sorry, support for people to grow. Um, that, that's been the reward of the job and I think why I do, do it. And that's why I went into teaching. Mm -hmm. I think starting at the, at the baseline with getting students to grow and empowering them, I've been able to continue with that philosophically um, as a superintendent as well. And, and I have to ask, with two superintendents sitting across from me, do you have to be a bit of a nerd to really like enjoy and, and sort of get that grind that has to happen year in, year out. You get to this point of the year, a lot of people are starting to mentally gear down. Yeah. You have to gear up because summer, you're, you're working overtime. It, what is that part of it like in, in terms of just sort of coping with the, the nonstop grind that it is? Well, I think you have to be a workhorse. Um, and unfortunately, you give things up. And, and Bob will be able to talk to this uh, even more so than I, uh, having uh, the years of experience and, and time that he has into administration. Um, but <clears throat> that's that's kind of uh, why I'm sitting here to some degree, um, is I'm hoping it brings a better uh, balance and quality of life, just being home. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also only one superintendent in each district. So an opportunity uh, like this to be superintendent um, back home and at Seneca Falls uh, Central School District doesn't happen very often and so you know I'm, I'm blessed and fortunate to be able to give that opportunity so you know the grind you've got to be able to uh, be willing to put in the time um, there's just no other way uh, to put it um, it's 24-7 365 it really is um, and so you make sacrifices in doing that and uh, sometimes that's sacrificing family time and events and so forth so um, I just think that's that's part of just being able and willing to, to do that, to do the job fully. I think that throughout my entire career, and I'm sure Jeremy will feel the same way, that I'm an educator. I was a teacher, 
And so I think people see teachers and even principals during the day, but those jobs require away time where they're doing work, they're doing lesson plans, they're preparing, they're doing reports. People don't see them during those times. So there's a lot of times when people don't see teachers or administrators doing that work. So I would just extend that to the same level as superintendents is the thing is, you know what you sign up for. And so as Jeremy said, to really feel like you're going to get immersed in the position and do it right, you know what you sign up for. And so the fact of the matter is, we're in a great community here in a great school district and part of doing it right is making yourself yourself accessible and visible and being able to communicate with people trying to create the balance to do things with family but also knowing that to do it right you want to immerse yourself in the job and part of that job is not just in the office Mm -hmm. it's in schools it's in the communities it's going to events with students and then doing your best to balance that out with family commitments but Um, I know that Jeremy's family is most supportive of him, just like my family has always been very supportive of me. Without that support system, it's it's not easy to do the job. It makes it even a little more difficult. So I know we're both fortunate in that regard with our wives and our families that are supportive of what we do. But one of the values of me working in Seneca Falls, I can sneak home for dinner and then go back to a meeting and an event. I know for a fact that Jeremy's going to go from probably a 45 minute commute to a seven minute commute. So that value that you can place back on family, if you add up those minutes every day, he might be able to sneak home for dinner or get to see his kids and then come back for a game or a meeting and still be able to do the job completely. Yeah, Uh, and and to that end, um, obviously this is, it's it's a drawn out process just from the administrative side of how how a school district goes about selecting. Um, but I'm curious what, what the transition has been like for the two of you, obviously now working right together side by side, mm-hmm. trying to get everything in order so that uh, this summer the transition can be done. Mm-hmm. Um, what has it been like? When did it start? Um, and what were some of the goals that you guys set out uh, with when you started? So I know by giving a year's notice that the, a primary responsibility of a board of education is to hire a superintendent. And so they began that process in September and October with some conversations with a search consultant. And it was probably around December, January, early January, uh, they had informed me that um, they were really looking at trying to close a deal with Jeremy to become the next superintendent. And I said, perfect match. Um, And so it was shortly thereafter when things got settled with the Board of Education um, that Jeremy and I began communicating, you know, almost immediately. The nice part of it is he's always been in that close circle of superintendents that I'd communicate with anyway. Right. Little did we know that this was going to happen probably last summer when I made my decision. But the thing is, we had already been communicating about things such as policy or kind of light. We have similar sized districts, so we'd always kind of pick each other's brains. <laughs> so we've been communicating ever since. And as things have gotten further along, we're talking a lot about transitional stuff because one year doesn't just end. It kind of bleeds into the summer and into next year. It's a continual process. So we've had the great opportunity to communicate in that regard. And Jeremy, just from your perspective, um, having to sort of walk into the new situation, Mm -hmm. um, what has that part of this whole transitional process been like? Sure, and you know, speaking to what a lot of things Bob has said, you know, I, I think we're more than colleagues, and so that uh, easy flow of information, be it uh, face-to-face, phone calls, emails, et cetera, um, but I've been able to have that opportunity because of uh, Bob's willingness to allow it to happen to start meeting with the administrative team. Uh, I've tried to come to the district a few times, just walk through some buildings, uh, hoping to do that, uh, you know, some more in the next couple of weeks. Um, so that, that communication uh, and things that are uh, in the process of planning, which are going to infect, or, uh, sorry, affect, impact the summer and next year. I've been uh, a part of those conversations and, and, and a voice in that, and um, we'll be continuing in the next couple of weeks and certainly hitting the ground running uh, in July. But there's a lot of things that we've been discussing uh, along the way that I've been able to be a part of that conversation. Um, and even so, um, to some extent, with the Board of Education as well. Um, just some major decisions that are going to be made uh, post-July, but the conversations are already happening. And, and I guess I'm curious, at what point do you start thinking about, okay, 
this is for real what I, I think or I want year one to look like. At what point in this process does that start flowing through your mind and you start trying to mentally sort out all the details? Sure. So um, as soon as uh, the board said uh, you're the next superintendent of Seneca Falls, that uh, really that process started happening. And, and so that's been driving some of those questions that I've asked um, of uh, be it board members, of course, Bob, um, and some of the other administrative team members. Um, you, you know, I, I've, I'm in Seneca Falls on a regular basis, um, going all the way back to, you know, work, starting uh, working here right out of high school in, in the community. And um, a lot of the, some of the people I'm closer to as far as friends who really live in Seneca Falls, right? So now I'm just looking at things from a different lens. Um, Bob talked about immersing yourself. That that's one of the advantages um, that not only myself but my family being able to immerse themselves in the community as well. Um, so th again, that just um, brings another point of pride. It, it brings uh, more fulfillment, uh, if you will, to us as a family. Um, so I just looking at things from a different lens. As soon as they said you're the superintendent of Seneca Falls, um, just evaluating those things, processing, uh, you know. What am I seeing? What, what can I uh, be a part of as far as tradition? What things can we do to um, benefit the community, the school district, uh, those relationships that are already taking place that we can continue to grow uh, between the school district and the community? Um, so all those things continue to, to be a part of uh, my thinking. But that's bringing that back then to uh, different team members and, of course, the whole team uh, as I immerse myself more and more and certainly after July 1. So th those things have already started to happen. Um, there's strategic plan in place. There's goals for the district. There's, there's all those things that I'm continuing to dive into and to, to better understand that I will become a part of. Right. And um, what will be my influence or um, my part in guiding or directing those moving forward? That's yet to be seen as I need to. Uh, first understand why are these our goals, uh, what's the data look like, what are the benefits to students. I have to understand all those things to uh, then engage in the conversation with the rest of the team, the district as a whole. And Bob, when you look back uh, at your career in total, what are some of the things that stand out to you? Uh, maybe not just as memories, but as sort of uh, things you're really proud of accomplishing and getting done, especially as superintendent. So things I think about as a superintendent and you know once again I'm part of a bigger process that includes the Board of Education a lot of teachers a lot of community members so I think about things such as academic courses or academic programming that I feel really good now that uh, students are graduating from minders and there are students with 30 40 college credits and they're actually entering colleges in their sophomore year and so that not only puts them in a better position to enter college but it also helps families with some uh, finances as far as saving a year of college costs. And that's not something that was in place a number of years ago, but it's taken a lot of people to make that happen. I think about the facilities. When I started, there was a, a, a weak point in our strategic plan that said we really need to address the facilities. Now, most people will see the public part of the facilities, which would be you know Brock Field and the stadium and the ability to have the track in the back of the building. And that was part of a bigger study that said we need to stop busing our kids all over town for athletics to the college, to kids' territory, and open up some more green space for kids to be able to participate. So I feel really good about that because we've accomplished that goal. The front of Minders looks completely different than the people that went there you know, 30 and 40 years ago. But on the inside, we've upgraded classrooms and learning spaces to kind of meet the needs of today's learners. So I think that's, that's also a point of pride. Probably one of the things that uh, stands out is the community partnerships. And so I remember the years where we lost an awful lot of state aid money when the economy tanked. And we kind of reached out to community partners and said, we need to work together. Whether it's the Women's Rights National Historical Park, whether it's Finger Lakes One, whether it's a historical society, Generations Bank, you name it. And I, you know, I'm not purposely leaving others out, but we, can, we, we connect with everybody. And somebody said to me, how can you do that? We've just lost $2 million. And my response is, how can you not? So it's really to kind of taking learning outside of the classroom walls to say, as a community, we educate all these children and graduate them. So I feel really proud about that, that we've made some really strong community partnerships during those years. So just very quickly, those are the things that come to mind during my years as superintendent. And, and Jeremy, when you hear all of that, when you hear all of these different things and all of the changes that have happened recently in the district, 
Um, what are some of your goals in terms of keeping these things intact and then continuing to grow them um, and then continuing to work and grow those uh, partnerships that uh, Bob just outlined all throughout the community to, to keep this ship moving forward? Sure. So I, I absolutely just do just that, Josh. Uh, keep that moving forward in that direction and, and continue to grow that um, uh, the best we can. Um, those opportunities, the, the more opportunities we can provide our students, the better. And uh, certainly the community has those abilities to allow us to do that. So um, continue to work with the administrative team and, and continue to work with all the, the faculty and staff. Um, they're the ones that um, ultimately are part of that um, happening as well um, so whether directly or indirectly involved it, it, it's it's going to take the entire district to work together uh, to partner with the community um, and so I you know I need to continue to get more to know more and more people in the community and, and those people we can partner with um, that we maybe we aren't and those that we are partnering with to continue to, to build on that relationship again it comes down to the benefits uh, of that to our students and a, a lot of positives obviously um, what is the biggest, we'll start with you, Bob, uh, what is the biggest challenge facing the district right now um, looking forward in just in the next two to three years? So I think it's trying to meet the evolving needs of today's learner. So it's hard to know what uh, careers and positions kids are going to be going into because there's studies out there that will say that half the high school kids will graduate and go into careers that aren't created yet. So what's the responsibility that trickles down to say, what does our program need to look like and what are the skills they need um, moving forward? So it's trying to always have an eye towards three years out. So I think that's a big piece to that. And how can we tweak what we do um, to meet those needs and put kids into a great position to be successful? Um, and one of the things that we're always faced with, and every district is faced with this, it's not just a Seneca Falls thing, how can we be as fiscally responsible to the community and do it um, and, and do all those things and put kids in a great position to be successful? Um, I know that we try, the Board of Education, administration, and I try to be very uh, keenly aware that um, taxes, taxes are, are an issue in this community. But the thing is, I'm also a big believer that if we don't provide these kids a great education, we may be paying higher tax dollars in the future. Now that doesn't minimize what's going on now. We get that. So how can we work with the resources that we have um, to, to, to meet those needs moving forward? And Jeremy, as you come in, obviously your experience in other districts or in other districts rather, um, what are some of the things that you've seen um, I guess that you want to make sure don't happen in Seneca Falls or you want to sort of guard against when you look at um, school districts as a whole? Um, I don't know if uh, guard against as much as <clears throat> I really would piggyback off of a couple of things uh, maybe Bob said, uh, Josh, and I, and I think it's looking at how do we support students, how do we support staff. So uh, Bob talked about you know preparing our kids for the future. I think part of that is uh, comes down to resources and opportunities uh, to prepare uh, our faculty and staff, right? It's providing that professional development so they can continue to grow uh, and shift based on the needs of our students. So providing them the opportunities um, that they need so they can continue to grow as educators. Um, and that's partnering with the Board of Education, you know, to do that, to identify, um, you know, where we put our resources, how, how we utilize that to support the staff to do those things. Um, and I think what we're all faced with, um, uh, you know, nationally, uh, we look at the social emotional needs of our students, we look at uh, the trauma that uh, many unfortunately our students are facing, and how do we uh, support them, how do we engage them, how do we empower those students uh, so they become those independent learners, they develop those skills, um, we often hear that the workforce telling us they need, um, you know, job-related soft skills, 21st century skills, whatever you want to call them, that we're actually providing those to our students. And so how do you go about doing that? That's what's ever-evolving. And that's where that PD for our staff, our faculty, to um, have so they can continue to evolve and grow as needed. So I don't know that it's um, being cautious as not to do something uh, that could be detrimental, if you will, as much as where do we need to put our focus, our time and energy, um, our resources to provide again for our students, which uh, reflects on what does our staff and faculty then need to be able to do that. And sort of playing the long game, 
I've asked different different forms of this question to you about before, um, but sort of with your career in mind, um, the last twenty plus years of experience, what does K through twelve education look like uh, in the next decade or a decade from now compared to what it looks like today? Very different in the middle or about the same? I think that we're in an instant gratification generation, right? So you think about it in terms of video games and you know kids want to um, beat the game or move on to the next level. And so once again, I, I just use that as an analogy to say, I think student learning is, has got to be different knowing that they leave us and then go to these kind of situations. And it may not be a video game, it just may be learning online. And so what does that look like to us? It doesn't mean you're sitting in a desk in a, at a desk in a chair all day long and listening to a teacher talk, that, that's old school. And so now it's how can I access information, um, learn from the teacher, but then learn by doing, and also have the ability to explore and be able to identify interests and be able to, um, to some degree, trial by error. So it's not like you get something right or you get something wrong. It's how do you do that? And in the process, um, you're creating your own learning style, but you're also identifying potential interests for moving forward. So you know, you, you think about career and tech, edit, uh, tech education, where uh, students are identifying different things that they can do well it's the same thing in classrooms. It's like choosing a reading material that is of interest to you, but maybe at your level. Um, same thing with science and social studies. So it's more about skills than it is about um, rote memorization anymore. And so how can we provide them with putting skills in their pocket that they can um, you know, reference when they need it and have the skills to learn moving forward? So I don't think the idea about a lifelong learner is any different than it was in the past. It's just how we accomplish that is probably a little bit different. Jeremy? Yeah, so um, there's, there's always uh, roadblocks, right? But I think it's a matter of trying to figure out how do we overcome those. I, I think anything we want to do, we can accomplish. It's just everybody putting their heads together to figure that out. And so when I look at school versus post-school, it's very limited anymore as to uh, a, a whistle or bell goes off and you get up and you move, right? You do, or you, that's when indicates we need to change something. So when I look at what are our students doing versus what is it going to look like post-school, that we have to start preparing more for that. So Carnegie units, uh, seat time, some of those things that the state still requires uh, are roadblocks maybe to making a, a bigger change in how we do things now. Um, I would say over the next 10 years, we're going to see that start to change. That's very concerning, that, that brings anxiety to me as a teacher, right, to say, oh boy, what's this gonna look like? That's where I'm saying we need the resources, um, the professional development, if we're gonna make shifts like that, that we make sure people are, are uh, prepared to do so. Um, so, you know, I'm really intrigued and, and believe in more of a project-based learning. Um, I believe we can get to the point where our kids know the standards better than we do because everything they're building as far as and of course that's age-based and, and the independence growing as kids get older but um, as as we allow more of that empowerment and more of that project based around maybe an interest or a passion a student has um, that they are building that relative to the standards in which they must meet um, post or, or uh, in order to be able to graduate so um, I think it's possible there are different models and things that exist out there um, some of them in other states where there might be uh, less requirements and allow some more freedom, but um, I think we can get there um, working with the, the uh, state education department, continue to advocate and push for some changes to allow us more flexibility, and then working together more locally uh, as a district and school board uh, and community to get there. So I, I'm curious to hear both of your perspective on this because you both sort of pointed to the same thing as regulation starts to lax a little bit there will be some creativity in the learning process mm -hmm. um, if administrators faculty teachers etc were left to their own devices what do you guys think the K through 12 model or, or school in general would look like compared to what it does now would it look drastically different where I think it would look a touch different I think it would empower teachers to be able to um, key in more on student interests, to be able to veer off of prescribed curriculum. 
and then that would also um, kind of direct where the curriculum goes because then there's some student ownership where you'd have greater student investment and then students would be empowered to steer their own learning. Not that they don't do it now, but once again, this is the time of year where you find that you have to get through a prescribed curriculum to get to an end assessment or, or an end regents exam. And so the fact of the matter is, I think what teachers would value is to free up some time to promote project-based learning. Another point of pride in our district is the uh, job shadowing and the internship that we have with pushing kids out in this community, which I would argue is probably more than most districts, or at least proportionately more than most districts. But to be able to relax some of the seat time to have them do that. So I think that would um, teachers would, would, would welcome some of those uh, freedoms to be able to do some of that. And it would allow them to key in a little bit more and, and uh, use technology and so on and so forth. Um, which, which really speaks to what Jeremy said about units and seat time and things like that. And is part of that because it isn't the most efficient way to teach kids? Any, is that part of the whole reason why that model may not work as great anymore? So I think promoting student engagement and empowerment is something that teachers absolutely want to do. But with every um, strategy that comes out, Sometimes there are some constraints because some of the required curriculum um, has not been relaxed. And so it, it, it has the appearance of piling on um, in, in, a, in a certain number of weeks. And so the fact of the matter is, um, how, can, how can we strike a balance or hit the sweet spot to be able to provide instruction that also uh, provides creativity by teachers but also meets student interests. And I, does that look like a semester model, like what they use at college? I don't know, but I think that's kind of um, the crossroads where I think, as Jeremy said, looking forward, there something has to give a little bit to make sure that education is current and evolving to help kids move forward. Do we ever get to a point where traditional tests are gone? They just aren't part of the model, or if they are, they're a very minor sort of piece of the pie rather than being the end sort of the end goal that everyone's working towards throughout the year well it's interesting because you know when we look at higher education um that still is happening right um we look at sats just to get into uh, college institutions so um that's changing but it's still more or less when you look at it holistically the same thing that you know was happening 30 years ago so um i, I don't I don't know if it goes away, if it if it just continues to look differently. Um, and there's great information that can be uh, taken from an assessment, right? And and that can be utilized in driving your instruction and, and really drilling that down to identify specifically what those students' needs are. So um, assessments are, are necessary. Um, how often, what format, uh, the purpose, what are you trying to you know get from those uh, as, a, as a learner so I can grow? Um, Obviously, you know, what, what, that, that's what drives it. What's the purpose or reason for it? But um, I'm not sure how far down the road that you may see some of the uh, what we consider traditional tests maybe go away versus do they just continue to evolve and, and look different. But those um, large assessments, uh, formative assessments are, are, are changing, you know, over time but still there. Bob? So... Uh, I, I, I'm in complete agreement with Jeremy, and I, I really think assessments or tests should drive your instructional plan. So no longer is, is it should be it begin with the end in mind. So the fact of the matter is, the test just doesn't identify what you know or what you got right or wrong. To some degree, it helps the teacher with some planning as far as what needs to be retaught or what needs to be reinforced. I'm a big believer that the current day and age and moving forward, the more that kids can demonstrate their learning in class, the better, um, because you don't know what it's like outside. So let's use homework as an assessment, not just a test. But very often, teachers will give homework to see what they know. But you don't know the conditions they're doing the homework in, whether they're getting support, um, so or what kind of technology support they're getting to do the homework. So the fact of the matter is, Performance-based assessments have entered into the picture. I don't know that traditional tests will go away, but I think they have to serve multiple purposes. Um, and any time that kids can demonstrate their learning through performance um, measures, 
I think that's helpful because those are that's the content and the skills they're going to maintain. The traditional tests, they prepare for the tests, but what kind of long-term memory are they going to have based on that? So I think goal and purpose is different, and I think everyone needs to recognize that moving forward. And I think that's a it's a major shift. I talked about higher ed. It's a major shift all the way up to our federal government um, because when we talk about accountability measures, um, it's tough to measure that portfolio that a student turned in right at the end of a project uh, versus taking some uh, common assessment that everybody it's very similar that everybody's taking and now you can run the data and you can uh, run the reports from accountability measures um, because everything's tied to funding so it really is going to take a whole different look at where we place education in our society um, and I think that that Locally, very important. There's no question that um, people believe in the educational system here in Seneca Falls, right? But on a larger scale, nationally, and you look at other countries, um, that value that we place overall on uh, the benefits, the need for educating our, our youth and hopefully developing them into being uh, lifelong learners, I think that mentality and, and where we place that value needs to change. And when you look ahead to day one of the next school year when you are fully immersed in this um, and flying solo what uh, what do you envision uh, not only experiencing but feeling on that first that that first actual day right so uh, even though I've been a superintendent it's still um, you know I think with that change it comes that pressure of how many people ultimately I'm responsible for right and so when I think about the children and and thinking about providing what we need to to support them and the education they need and, and all the other pieces that they need to be uh, healthy and safe and growing as a learner. Um, you know, there, there's some weight, there's some pressure there. Um, and at the same time, there's some pride of saying, you know, I have the opportunity to uh, work with a great uh, team, be it administrators, board of education, faculty, staff, coaches, transportation, food service, name the people, right, um, that are doing all the great things. I have the opportunity to be a part of that and share in their great work um, to make this district, you know, continue to make this district uh, the great district that it, that it is that Bob has helped uh, get us to where we are. And Bob, when you look ahead to day one of retirement, what does <laughs> that day look like? I would imagine it's probably a little less stressful than Jeremy's first day is going to be. <laughs> So obviously it's a little bittersweet. So the first memory that comes or thought that comes to mind would be um, to be able to say thank you. You heard Jeremy say earlier, there aren't a lot of superintendents. There's only one in every district. And I had the you know honor and privilege to serve as superintendent in this community. And so I am, I, I am deeply grateful for that opportunity. Um, I will be his biggest fan and I will always be a great fan of the district. So will my wife and our family. Um, 27 years ago when we came here and I came here for an interview, little did we know that this would become our home and as we retire, it is our home. So hopefully we can continue to be immersed in the community and um, we will always be rooting for the district and, and for Jeremy Klingerman. Gentlemen, I appreciate the time. Thanks for coming in. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Josh. New episodes are published every Sunday on FingerLakes1.com. Check them out there or wherever you listen to podcasts. Search Sunday Conversation with Josh Durso on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or any other platform, even Google, and subscribe while you're there. That's the easiest way to check out archived episodes of the show, and it's also the easiest way to learn when new episodes are uploaded. The team does have one favor to ask of you if you are a regular listener. Consider becoming a Patreon supporter. News isn't free, and conversations like this one go way beyond reprinted AP stories you get in the local newspaper. Visit patreon.com slash fl1 to learn more. Thanks for listening, guys, and I'll see you next week.